Hello, I'm Sensei Alex Kakio. Thank you for joining me for this evening's Dharma Sunday, where we take canonical Buddhist teachings and tie them to real world events. The title of today's talk is Dharma Practice and the UN's Climate Change Report. Before we get into that, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post talks in the future. If you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that'd be great too. So the UN released a report earlier this week discussing climate change and the effects that are happening as a result. And it created a bit of a stir because the report wasn't good. Um, they actually had some pretty frightening things to say about where we're heading and what the possible results of that of our current situation are going to be. So I'd like to read part of the report. Uh, this is coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is the organization associated with the UN that's responsible for putting out these reports. And then I'll discuss how we as Dharma practitioners, as Buddhists, can respond. So let's see the report coming from the IPCC. Uh, it says climate change, widespread, rapid, and intensifying. Geneva, August 9th. Scientists are observing changes in the Earth's climate in every region and across the whole climate system. According to the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC report released today. Many of the changes observed in the climate are unprecedented in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And some of the changes already set in motion, such as continued sea level rise, are irreversible over hundreds to thousands of years. However, strong and sustained reductions in emissions of carbon dioxide, CO2, and other greenhouse gases would limit climate change, while benefits for air quality would come quickly. It could take 20 to 30 years to see global temperature stabilize, according to the IPCC Working Group 1 report, Climate Change 2021, The Physical Science Basis, approved on Friday by 195 member governments of the IPCC through a virtual approval session that was held over two weeks, starting on July 26. The Working Group 1 report is the first installment of the IPCC's sixth assessment report, AR6, which will be completed in 2022. The report reflects extraordinary efforts under exceptional circumstances, said Sung Lee, chair of the IPCC. The innovations in this report and advances in climate science that it reflects provide an invaluable input into climate negotiations and decision making faster warming. The report provides new estimates for the chances of crossing the global warming level of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next decades and finds that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. The report shows that emissions of greenhouse gases from human activities are responsible for approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming since 1850 to 1900, and finds that averaged over the next 20 years, global temperature is expected to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. This assessment is based on improved observational data sets to assess historical warming as well as well progress in scientific understanding of the response of the climate system to human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. This report is a reality check, said IPCC Working Group 1 co-chair Valerie Mason Delmont. We now have a much clearer picture of the past, present, and future climate, which is essential for understanding where we are headed, what can be done, and how we can prepare every region facing increasing changes. Many characteristics of climate change directly depend on the level of global warming, but what people experience is often very different to the global average. For example, 
warming over land is larger than the global average and is more than twice as high in the Arctic. Climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. The changes we experience will increase with additional warming, said IPCC Working Group 1 co-chair Pan Mao Zai. The report projects that in the coming decades, climate change will increase in all regions for 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. There will be increasing heat waves, longer warm seasons, and shorter cold seasons. At 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, heat extremes would more often reach critical tolerance thresholds for agriculture and health, the report shows. But it's not just about temperature. Climate change is bringing multiple different changes in different regions, which will all increase with further warming. These include changes to wetness and dryness, to wind, snow, and ice, coastal seas, and oceans, for example. Climate change is intensifying the water cycle. This brings more intense rainfall and associated flooding, as well as more intense drought in many regions. Climate change is affecting rainfall patterns. In high latitudes, precipitation is likely to increase, while it's projected to decrease over large parts of the subtropics. Changes to monsoon precipitation are expected, which will vary by region. Coastal areas will, be will see continued sea level rise throughout the 21st century, contributing to more frequent and severe coastal flooding in low-lying areas and coastal erosion. Extreme sea level events that previously occurred once in 100 years could happen every year by the end of this century. Further warming will amplify permafrost thawing and the loss of seasonal snow cover, melting of glaciers and ice sheets, and loss of summer Arctic sea ice. Changes to the ocean, including warming, more frequent marine heat waves, ocean acidification, and reduced oxygen levels have been clearly linked to human influence. These changes affect both ocean ecosystems and the people they, that rely on them, and they will continue throughout at least the rest of this century. For cities, some aspects of climate change may be amplified, including heat, since urban areas are usually warmer than their surroundings. Flooding from heavy precipitation events and sea level rise in coastal cities. Um, the report goes on, but I think you get the idea. If you would like to read the entire thing, it's at ipcc.ch. It's uh, one of several reports that they put out on this subject. <sighs> so, that's a lot. Essentially, what the report says, at least what I read from it, is that we are reaching the point of no return. If we reach uh, an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in the average global temperature, the changes to our climate will be drastic and they will be potentially irreversible. It also says that we are at a point that it would require rather drastic changes to our lifestyle and way of living in order to reverse the trend. So what to do? Now, I personally have been an environmental activist for almost as long as I have been alive. When I was six, I was telling my mom to drive me to the recycling center so I could turn in my aluminum cans. Maybe some of you remember how in school, um, us old fogies were told, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? And there were the three arrows that went around. So I recycled aluminum cans because I wanted to save the planet. That was important to me. My grandparents, they ate a lot of pops or they drank a lot of pops. So they'd save all their cans in a big, garbage bag for me, and then we'd save the cans at my house as well, and then we'd drive to the recycling center where I'd get a whopping five cents per pound for my aluminum cans. One time when I was eight, I remember my parents were emptying out our basement and they had this big 
steel filing cabinet. No one even knew where it came from. And I put the magnet on it and realized it was steel. And oh no, we can't throw this out. We need to you know, take it to the recycling center. So my dad loaded it into the minivan and my mom drove me and we got a whopping one penny per pound for all this steel we brought to be recycled. So I think we got maybe 45, 50 cents. I'm also pretty sure that was when my mom decided she wasn't driving me to the recycling center any longer. <laughs> so yeah, environmentalism has always been important to me. The natural world, the earth has always been important to me in part because I was socially awkward as a child. I didn't do small talk well, but when I was in the woods, I felt safe. I was involved in Boy Scouts. That probably added to it as well. We learned no trace camping, right? Leave only footprints, take only photos. And now I live in a homestead in the country and I'm surrounded by trees and grass. And now environmentalism isn't just theoretical to me, it's also real, right? How much rainfall are we going to get? Is it enough for the crops? How much water is in the well? Is the aquifer being poisoned? Is our, is our groundwater healthy? These are things I have to worry about now that I didn't have to worry about when I lived in the city. So when I read the report from the IPCC, I wasn't surprised. This, we've been heading in this direction for a while. I was a little disappointed. I, I'd hoped we'd made at least a little progress, right? But I also, having been involved with these causes for so long, recognize the difficulty, right? So recycling, for example, when I was a child, that was the cure-all. We'll just recycle everything. And then we found out, well, actually, it only makes sense to recycle glass and metal because it's actually cheaper to pull oil out of the ground and make new plastic bottles than it is to recycle the old ones. And paper actually loses a lot of quality when we recycle it, so it's almost not worth it. On top of that, uh, a lot of the things we put in recycling end up in landfills. I was a little heartbroken. I've been recycling since I was a child, so that was sad news to me, but I guess what's happening is it's just costing so much money to sort through the recycling as compared to creating new stuff. We used to send our recycling to China and then they would recycle it, but now they don't accept it anymore. So it kind of sits in the city dump for a while. They try to find a buyer and if they can't, it goes in the same place as everyone else, as everything else. My first instinct when I read reports like what was put out by the IPCC is, well, everyone should just stop driving cars and we'll just lower our carbon footprint that way. I personally have been a full-time bike commuter for about six years now. I don't own a car. I ride my bike places or I use tr public transportation. If it's a long distance or I need to look presentable, if I'm going somewhere, then I'll use a rideshare service. But even that isn't a cure-all because our society is built around cars. It's built under the assumption that you either have a vehicle or you have access to a vehicle to drive from point A to point B. So the suburbs, our highway system, they're not walking or biking friendly. So I can't tell someone with five kids they have to haul around, don't drive a car. That's not feasible. What to do? The more I think about these things, the more hopeless it seems. But then I read the fire sermon. I read it quite a bit, actually. Uh, this is a sermon. I believe it was the third discourse the Buddha gave after coming out from under the Bodhi tree, but don't quote me on that. And I'll just read the sermon or read part of the sermon first and then I'll tell you what it has to do with climate change. 
Uh, this translation is coming from suttacentral.com, or .net rather, if you'd like to read it yourself. And in it, the Buddha says, mendicants, all is burning. And what is the all that is burning? The eye is burning. Sights are burning. Eye consciousness is burning. Eye contact is burning. The painful, pleasant, or neutral feeling that arises, conditioned by eye contact, is also burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fires of greed, hate, and delusion. Burning with rebirth, old age, and death. With sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. So what Buddha does in the fire sermon is he goes through all six of our senses. So that's the five we're used to, sight, hearing, sound, taste, touch, and also mind or perception is also considered a sense field in Buddhism. So all six of our senses. And he says that everything we take in through our senses, the entire world as we know it, is burning. It's a potential source of suffering, a source of sorrow, lamentation with pain, sadness, and distress. It is burning. Buddha wasn't an optimist. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do as Dharma practitioners is to simply accept that we live in samsara, that because we live in samsara, we will suffer. And step two is to figure out how to suffer well, how to alleviate suffering for ourselves and all sentient beings, knowing that we will fail. Knowing that no matter how hard we try, we will suffer. We will suffer birth, aging, sickness, and death. And in between, we will lose friends, we will gain enemies, we will lose the things we want, and we will gain the things we don't want. Those are the eight winds I just referenced, the things that all sentient beings must endure as a consequence of living in samsara. So we can look at that and we can give up, or like I said, we can try to suffer well. And that's what we do as Buddhists. That's why we practice the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, the Six Perfections, the Four Brahma Viharas, not because we believe we can stop the world from burning, but because we believe that we can make our suffering a little less, that we can make life a little better for ourselves and others if we live and practice well. It's all coming to an end. But what we do between this moment and that final moment is what defines us, not just as Buddhists, but as human beings. We see this example put forth by Kanan, who is the Bodhisattva of compassion. There's a beautiful story where she decides she's going to save all hell beings from suffering. So these are people who are the worst of the worst. Individuals who have just done terrible things, killed their parents, okay? That level of bad. They're in the Avicii hells, being tormented because of their bad karma. But Kanan decides she's going to save them because in Buddhism, we believe no one is beyond saving. So she goes down there and she begins her work. And one by one, she begins saving these sentient beings, helping them to be reborn as humans or some of them even in the heaven realms. And after countless kalpas, she completes her task. Hell is empty. 
There are no more demons there. The doors are waving in the wind. And then she blinks. And just as quickly, hell is refilled. All the demons were gone, and then a new set came in just that quickly. Now, in spite of that, I believe Kanan was not a failure. She was a success because of her following actions, which were to go back down into hell and begin her work again. Knowing that the work would never be complete, knowing that there will always be hell beings that need saving, she continues to try. And in her trying, Kanan, the Bodhisattva of compassion, saves all beings from suffering because she makes the world just a little bit better. And we, as Buddhists, praise Buddha, we can follow her example. The world is ending. So what? We can still make things better. We are going to suffer. We are going to get old and die. So what? We're alive now. And while we're alive, we can make things a little bit better. So while I am disappointed by the report that came from the IPCC, I'm not without hope. Because I know from the example of Kanan, from the example of Buddha, that even though the world is burning, we can find happiness here in this moment. So I recycle even though I know that it will probably end up in a landfill. I care for my chickens and my cats, knowing that countless animals are going extinct all over the world because of climate change. Even so, my chickens are going to have a really wonderful life. I take time out to spend time with my partner to compliment her and tell her how wonderful and important she is to me. Not because I think it'll make the entire world better, but it'll make life better for her and me as well. <laughs> and we can all do this as well. I think the lesson we can take from the climate change report is that we should focus on the little things. We should focus on what we're doing here at home. Maybe we can't save the entire world, but we can save our household. We can save our children. We can make life better for our animals. Maybe we can't get our governments to conserve water and electricity, but we can. And maybe in another 10 years, we'll find that we've passed the point of no return. But it won't be for naught, because we still did our best. And in Buddhism, doing our best is the goal. Because we recognize that it's not the winning that matters, it's the attempt. Amitabha. So that's the talk for today. I hope it was helpful. If you have questions, comments for myself or the Sangha, please leave them in the comment section below. If it's directed towards me, I promise I'll respond. And I'll end with just a few announcements. So this is Dharma Sunday. It happens every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at this channel. On Wednesdays, you can also join us for meditation and sutra study. That's a little bit more involved. That includes a 15 minute guided meditation, a Dharma talk, followed by a Q&A. So I hope to see you there. Until next time, Amitabha.